Well, students of dynamics, let's go ahead and start our particle motion or particle kinetics chapter talking about one dimensional particle motion. Now, in my version of dynamics, I really only get up into two dimensions. There certainly is three dimensional dynamics, which gets quite complicated equation wise. So we'll stick to one dimensional and then build into two dimensional systems. And so as we look at one dimensional particle motion, we can think that we're relating these three terms. We're relating position to velocity to acceleration. And hopefully you remember on this topic that as we're going from position to velocity to acceleration, and this would be a recollection from all your physics knowledge, that we essentially are taking derivatives which derivatives, you really can think of derivatives are slopes, right? They're slopes of graphs. So slopes from, now we often use S for a one dimensional position. We'll use R as we get into two dimensional, but as we go from S to V to A, we're talking about taking derivatives. Okay, so let's take a look and say we have a position function that looks something like this. Right, so this graph is position as a function of time. And keep in mind, this is one dimensional position. So this is not a two dimensional graph like a projectile motion. This is simply saying that something starts with a positive displacement, it's going to reach some maximum distance, and then its displacement is really going to return to where it was before, right? Because your S is going to go from zero over here to zero over there over some delta t, over some time interval. So looking at this curve we could find an instantaneous slope at any point along here which is equal to the rise over the run and that is going to be the ds times the dt right an infinitesimally small run dt and the infinitesimally small rise ds and of course we know that our velocity v happens to be equal to this function ds dt. So what we're seeing in this case, assuming that we have a quadratic function, okay, a squared function that we have for our position curve, that our velocity will then vary linearly from some maximum value at t is equal to zero. There's going to be a zero value up top here, and then it's going to go negative, right, as the slope goes negative. And so we could draw a hypothetical v as a function of t curve. Okay, so this is my v as a function of t. Now, it also has a slope, right, rise over run. We could label this the dv dt. Okay, rise over run. And notice that this has a negative slope all the way across. I tend to use purple for accelerations in dynamics. So here's my purple line, negative value and constant. This is my A as a function of time graph. It is negative because this slope that is right over here is a negative slope, while the slope here changed from positive to zero to negative. Okay, so we could also write here for acceleration, of course, that acceleration is equal to dv dt, the time rate of change of the velocity. So it should make sense that if we are using derivatives going from position to velocity to acceleration, that we then could also employ integrals, bringing in our other friends from Calc 1. Okay, so integrals. which integrals fundamentally are areas under a curve, right? Area under a curve. And we can integrate essentially going from the right to the left. Okay, so that covers all of our position as a function of time, velocity as a function of time, acceleration as a function of time. But what happens if we have a problem? So what if we have velocity um, as a function of position 
So we could write that a v as a function of s. And so instead of having a t, time in the equation, it has an s. And what also happens if we have an acceleration? Once again, as a function of position. which would be an a as a function of s. Okay, then if we took a t derivative, it's really not going to make much sense. So we need to get things into a form. We can take a position derivative versus a time derivative. Now we're still going to start with our fundamental equation relating velocity and acceleration, which is acceleration is equal to dv dt. Now there's going to be a little math trick that we're going to do here that we're fundamentally going to multiply and divide by the same term. So we're going to multiply and divide by ds, okay, this, this infinitesimally small position. And so when we do that, we end up with our acceleration is equal to dv. I'm going to separate these out. Here's my dt. And here I'm going to bring in my ds and another ds. Okay, so still a dv in the top, still a dt in the bottom. Now just brought in top and bottom a ds. And what we can notice in looking at this equation is we now have a ds dt, which hopefully you'll recognize what is ds dt. That's velocity. And so we can rewrite this equation as a is equal to dv ds times v or a ds is equal to v dv. So let me show you how we can use this equation as it relates to a graph. Okay, so now we're going to draw two graphs. This one was going to be a velocity as a function of position. And then similarly, we're going to have an acceleration as a function of position. Okay, so the graph we're going to take a look at is, or the velocity relationship, is going to be v is equal to 3 times s minus 2. This is going to be in meters per second. And this s right here is going to be a distance in meters. Okay, an equation, 3 times s minus 2. And so the key thing to notice here kind of the, the flag to go off in your brain is there's not a T in this equation, there's an S. And so I'm gonna to need to use this other relationship. All right, so we can go ahead and plot this. We don't need to do anything else to plot this function. And so when we have a zero position, right, which is over here um, on, so when we have a zero position over here on our, um, on kind of our V axes. So if this is equal to zero, it's equal to minus two. Okay, so our um, value here at s is equal to zero is equal to minus two in velocity. And then as we get over, let's go ahead and just pick a point over here and we'll pick that point s is equal to two and all these are going to be in meters on the s curve. So if we put a two in for s, we get three times two is six minus two is four. And so then we end up here at a value of four over on our end up with a value of four and these are of course all in meters per second over on our vertical graph and you'll notice the structure of the equation it's a linear function right you have a slope of three times a horizontal distance and then the minus two becomes our y-intercept and so we then could draw a straight line between these two points and so this is our v as a function of s now one thing to notice here is this also has a slope slope being rise over run the rise is going to be dv the run is going to be ds and we can write up here that dv ds is equal to what? What out of that equation would be the slope? 
you should be looking here at that three. And so it has a constant value of three slope. Okay, so that would just be to draw the, the velocity as a function of position. Now I draw the acceleration as a function of position. We really need to kind of plot some points. Okay, so let me just bring over a little bit of information. One is that we're going to use this equation right here. Our acceleration is equal to the dv ds times v. We know that our dv ds is equal to 3 across the entire um, thing. So we have that dv ds is equal to 3. Okay, so if dv ds is equal to 3, I need to worry about that one. I need to look at what is the velocity at s is equal to 0. Well, I come back over here to this graph, and I see over here at s equal to 0, my velocity was negative 2. So negative 2 times 3 gives me a value of negative 6. And so I can plot that here. At s is equal to 0, my acceleration is equal to negative 6. All these accelerations will be in meters squared per second for our units in SI units. All right, moving along, let's go ahead and go over here to our point of um, two meters. Okay, so on our graph here, here's our two, and of course this is in meters. And so then we could plug in at two, we found a value over here of velocity of four. So four times three is 12. Okay, so we find out that at, um, s is equal to 2, we have a value here of positive 12. Now, one of your questions should be is, well, is this a linear function or not? A couple of different options. You could go into any kind of uh, plotting, your calculator, anything else, and you could graph this if you wanted to. You could, um, you certainly could put in points. Um, we could go through and find, say, this point here where v is equal to zero. And you can find that that's going to be two thirds, um, up two thirds of a meter is going to be s. There's a lot of different ways you could look at this. Another way you could look at it is that dv ds is constant, right? So looking at this equation right here, we have a constant value of dv ds, and then our velocity, as we can see over from this other function, increases linearly its entire distance. Okay, so if we have a constant times a linearly changing value, it turns out that our acceleration also turns out to be a linear function. Okay, so this would be my acceleration as a function of position. So what you'll notice in this equation is that while if this is all as a function of time, that our derivative, a dt derivative of a velocity as a function of time graph would give us a constant value. Uh, if we have a non, or excuse me, if we have a velocity that varies with position, we have to work through the dvds. Now dvds um, may also vary with position, and then essentially you're just going to end up plotting points or coming up with the actual full equation. Um, but this just kind of gives you an overview of how to work these velocity and acceleration as a function of position equations and graphs. So hopefully that gets you started on remembering these fundamental relationships between position, velocity, and acceleration. So now bringing these equations into a general framework that you can use across kind of any problem, it turns out any one dimensional problem or independent directions on two dimensional problems. Here's an equation table that actually comes from your review sheet. And it's also on your equation sheet that basically outlines the relationships between all these different terms. And fundamentally just applies a little bit of calculus and a little bit of algebra to rearrange them in various forms. In the first half of this video, we talked through essentially the graphical relationships and the fundamental relationships here um, in this column, right? Our basic equations. Now, one thing that I've added in here is a little bit of notation. Realize that S dot means the time rate of change of the position, okay? So anywhere you see one of these dots, you can think that this is referring to the time rate of change or fundamentally take whatever variables underneath it and essentially fold that inside of this differential where we can pop the s 
right into there. Okay, so time rate of change of whatever variable is underneath it. Now, as we move across this table from left to right, all we're really doing here is essentially doing separation of variables and taking some integrals, also doing some substitution as we get over here into the constant acceleration column. Okay, so hopefully you will all remember how to do some simple separation of variables. That would be in the context if we have V is equal to DS DT, and we do a separation of variables. So we bring our dt over to the left-hand side. So v dt is equal to ds. Now, whenever you have these variables separated, you always integrate them with respect to the variable that's on that side of the equation. Okay, so this is gonna be an integral of dt. So this is gonna be from t naught to t1. And this is going to be an integral of s from s naught to S1, and so we can end up with the equation, our integral of V dt equal to S minus S, and I guess this would be S1 minus S naught right, with using our, our limits. Now in this table here, I just realized that they're using not as the initial location and um, just the variable as the final. Okay, so in this version, it would be um, S. And so essentially this equation that I just wrote here is the equation right here. Okay, so it's just doing some basic calculus and algebraic manipulation to get some different versions of these equations. Now the furthest right column is kind of a handy one because it deals with constant acceleration. Okay, so constant acceleration, the most classic constant acceleration we'll deal with in this class is gravitational acceleration. We make an assumption that gravitational acceleration is, is equal everywhere on the surface of the Earth. It's not a bad assumption. It actually varies a little bit with elevation and some different factors. But in a general sense, we can assume that gravitational acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared or 32.2 feet per per second squared. And so that becomes a, some handy formulations to use in constant acceleration cases. If you have non-constant acceleration, there are times you need to take a quick integral uh, in order to figure out um, your various velocities or positions. Okay. Another thing that's folded into this table is fundamentally the um, spatial relationships between position, velocity, and acceleration. We talked about this a little bit in the previous lecture as well, but essentially that the change in velocity is the area under the acceleration as a function of time graph. That shows up here as uh, letter A, which is right in the middle here. Right, The integral under the A as a function of T is equal to the change in velocity. Uh, in the same context, the integral of the velocity function is the change in the position. Now, this one's a little bit more complicated here. One half of v squared sub 1 minus v naught squared, the area under the a is a function of position. We kind of talked through that one in the previous example. We actually didn't map out that area, but you could go back to that example and map out that area as well. And then here's the equation we actually used on the previous example, is that the acceleration is equal to the instantaneous velocity at that same position, and then the slope as the velocity is a function of position graph. Okay, so that's going to be uh, this equation right here. So just fundamentally relating our equations to our spatial relationships among these different terms. So now bringing these equations into a general framework that you can use across kind of any problem, it turns out any one dimensional problem or independent directions on two dimensional problems. Here's an equation table that actually comes from your review sheet. And it's also on your equation sheet that basically outlines the relationships between all these different terms. And fundamentally just applies a little bit of calculus and a little bit of algebra to rearrange them in various forms.